All right, everybody. So this is Chris Delion here, uh, home team game dev these days, long zigzaggy career. I'll be talking about bits and pieces of today, uh, particularly just about my general game development career path and some adjacent things to it. Uh, specifically, we're going to be covering how I got my interest in my current field, my academic and self-taught journey. There's a mix of both going on. Spent lots of time getting formal credentials, but also lots of time informally practicing learning these things on my own. And related volunteer and internships I've participated in that have been relevant to my work, what I enjoy most about the work that I do, and then a variety of additional connected careers to game development, besides kind of the most obvious, which is a part of that thread, all of which I have direct experience in. So during the q and I'm happy to kind of further go into detail, stories, anecdotes, clearing up questions about other bits and pieces. How I became interested in the career path is like a lot of people in games, but not everybody. I grew up playing a bunch of video games. It's not a requirement. I know plenty of other friends who have got into the field later on. They started playing games in high school or when they were adults or something. But an interest in it doesn't hurt. It can become a part of your vocabulary of design, referencing examples like this one, like that one, and what I liked about this, and kind of just helps us stay in it and keep going through some of the ups and downs of a sometimes a tumultuous field it can be. Uh, being on the computer, obviously, it is different playing games than spending lots of time on the keyboard and mouse in editors, troubleshooting stuff, like even just setting up this call today. It is a very normal part of being on a computer to just be kind of struggling through that. So specifically, that's where part three comes out, figuring out puzzles, literally the work of engineering, which half my time's kind of designer, half of it's engineering, I guess somewhere in there, another half somehow producer, but basically fixing puzzles. Okay, why is it broken? Troubleshooting, getting past, it's not quite working. And certain people find that unbearably frustrating, have a hard time with it, nothing wrong with those people, but it might be a tough line of work because basically the work that you're doing with games is you're working with pieces that don't work yet. They're broken. Why is it broken? How do I fix it? How can I tell which part's broken? How can I verify my fix mattered? And as soon as it's actually working, I don't enjoy it. I go find the next broken piece and then put all my attention on figuring out the puzzle of why and how is that not doing what it's supposed to do? Or if it doesn't exist yet, making a broken thing to fix. And then lastly, I've always enjoyed doing projects with friends. This is a major component of making games socially with other people who have different skills, backgrounds, and lenses. They might have years of art training or music training or writing training or production training, but it's something where you get to work through challenges creatively with people. You get to brainstorm about how and why aliens would do certain things and about how what the player expects to happen. And it's just going to be a very fun space to work in, but ultimately it is still ultimately, it's a group project. And so some people, again, might find that they dislike things about group projects Buckle up if you're doing games because most games you enjoy, with a handful of exceptions throughout history people like to point to, but most games you enjoy are fundamentally deeply big old team projects. Now, part of what also inspired me, or way when I was probably younger than y'all are now, a show called Clarissa Explains It All Nickelodeon had this character, and part of what she did in high school was she programmed computer games for fun as a hobby. She wasn't selling them. She wasn't trying to get a hit. She wasn't trying to get a career doing it. She was just another way to express herself. Like some people like to dance or sing or do pottery or whatever it is people like to do to express themselves. She made computer games about herself and her friends and her family and her school situations as a way to express her ideas, entertain herself, amuse herself. This became kind of a major part of my work as well, where even no matter my careers involve lots of making games for pay and professional and earning my income, any given time, I'm still releasing a minimum of four free games or more a year that are just for hobbyists, for fun, for engagement, for enrichment. Like if you know somebody who has a model railroad in their basement and they just, they like to be down there painting little trees and building little buildings, that's a side of game development that no matter what someone's day job, career, or life path might be in, you can, and I would say still should, be making computer games. Gabe Newell quote here, of course, founder of Steam, also a company known for Half-Life franchise and things like that. But the programmers of tomorrow are the wizards of the future. You're going to look like you have magic powers compared to everybody else. And this is one of those things where increasingly as... People are working remote. People are finding their entertainment online. People are socializing online. People are, in certain ways, existing in online in ways we used to in person only. As a computer programmer or a software developer or a game developer, you have a weird amount of control in terms of how these spaces get crafted and what opportunities are structurally available to people. And that's a neat power to be able to have to just kind of create the spaces that you and your friends want to live in. Uh, so this is some of my early inspiration, missed and never ending story where people were imagining worlds into existence that other people could experience. And I like that magical lens because it can be a little less sort of gear heady or uh, mechanically oriented than our engineering lens typically is, which again can be very troubleshooting, problem solving, but imagination's at the root of what we're doing. And more recent examples here, we got Inception, we got, uh, say, recent, obviously, asterisks next to it. Uh, Once Upon a Time, if you're familiar with that television show, again, people writing worlds into reality that other people can experience 
is I don't want to lose track of that as a thread of what's cool about making video games, even aside from its relation to our careers and jobs. I got started with C for Dummies. This was mid-90s. I don't necessarily encourage starting with this particular book anymore. It was a good fit at the time. It's no longer how most things get done. Wouldn't hurt you either. But in the back of it, it had an example that moved a letter side to side, up and down randomly. Flipped a die, flipped a coin, and based on how it lands, I guess rolled a four-sided die, essentially. Uh, went up, down, left, or right each time. And this was my starting point, because, okay, as soon as you can have a position on screen dictated by variables, then I could leave a trail and have a snake, and I could have other positions that compare to when they get close enough, I eat the apple, or I get caught by the hunter, or I bumped into the tree, and this was the foundation for making games graphically as soon as I could tie positions to numbers in the code. So my academic and self-taught journey when I got started in 1997, uh, so at the time I was late middle school, early high school, I was using C++ and Assembly. That's the games you see on the left side here. They're remakes of old Atari era stuff that, to be clear, predated me. So yes, those games are older than y'all. They are older than me as well. Those weren't the games I grew up playing. I grew up playing Mario and Quake and things like that, but it wasn't Pong. It wasn't Breakout. It wasn't Qbert. It wasn't Pac-Man. I remode those not because I had an affinity for them, because I wanted to learn the foundations and fundamentals. It's like if you're learning piano, you do Mary Had a Little Lamb or something. If you're playing different kind of things you want to get good at, right? You want to become a cook, you make a basic recipe before a more sophisticated one. It helps to go back to the roots because these are cases where one person with finite time, finite expertise can fulfill a whole game's requirements of design, engineering, writing, etc. Because they're so much more simplistic that you're not spreading yourself too thin and you're able to kind of have the whole thing in your head all at once. It was a great space to learn in sort of a self-educated path because at the time I didn't have in my high school, certainly in the Midwest, computer science or game programming classes or something. This was just me and my own time finding books in the library. On the right, we have some of the games started doing with Teams. This, of course, really opened up where by using the ability to add better graphics, better music, better sound, it wasn't just gated by the fact I didn't know how to program those things. It was that at, at a sheer volume of time required to do these things well it just makes a difference, right? It's the difference between one person trying to move a couch alone or a refrigerator alone or having two or three friends to help you do it. It suddenly becomes so much more doable. And even if the people involved aren't necessarily specialists, several of the games you see here, they all, most of the people who were mostly involved were still deeply kind of programmers at heart. That's how I found them. They were my classmates in computer science or something. But the, sh the sheer fact that out of four of us, one said, I'm mostly going to worry about how it looks. And once that I'm mostly going to worry about how it sounds, once that I'm mostly going to worry about the level design or the tuning of the vehicles or something, you get a better result than if it's just one person spreading themselves thin between, okay, well, the bugs are, are breaking my code, but also I need to make art and that it doesn't result in something that's as cool to share. This is probably mostly amusing myself, but I still have my old notebooks from when I was doing some of this design work on paper. Uh, things have gotten easier and better in terms of visual development. But back in the day, this was part of what I did that I still just enjoy uh, and, you know, kind of the, just that gearhead mentality. These sort of games, uh, Burger Time, and again, obviously, I, these are not the ones I made. But if you're not familiar with the old classics, I do encourage going back to play the old Atari era stuff, if only again as a lexicon for simpler grammars of games that were fun and achieved entertainment results that again, like, pushed our industry forward without having enormously complex and rich 3D environments, without requiring a whole bunch of writing content and custom art, without requiring really sophisticated physical simulations, it's an it's an area worth adding to your design repertoire and vocabulary. I started getting into team projects around uh, undergrad. This is where my academic journey started. I took my first computer science classes at Carnegie Mellon, where I got a comp sci degree. I was there 2003 to 2007. And 2004, I helped, helped establish a group of students who has a big old extracurricular group were making video games together. At the time, even in the comp sci program, we did not have many options for game programming in the academic pathway. Those have gotten better, but at the time, basically the only way we got these projects in our portfolios and our background and our experience to talk about interviews and things was to do them in our own time outside, in addition to our classes on data structures and algorithms and operating systems and networking and so on. At the time, those games were made with C++ using Allegro, SDL, OpenGL, or DirectX for our libraries. And again, not saying those are necessarily the right things to use now, just for historical context, that's what we were using back then. For This has also started to intersect my internships and volunteer work. We're in my first internship with Electronic Arts Los Angeles over a summer uh, between sophomore and junior year. And I was there as a technical game design intern working on authoring weapon upgrade systems, coming up with standards for level design, working on sort of some syntax things related to how the AI worked and things like that. But it was an enormous team, right? So I, I, I my background was previously these really tiny teams of five, eight people, maybe three people. Uh, this was a 180 to 280 person project, depending on where in the four or five year lifespan we're talking about. 
And so that was an enormous undertaking where I would go there for one summer, chip away at this project, go back to school, make another four or five little games, go back for the next summer. It was still this project. Go back to school, make another four or five little games. Went back for like full time finishing this same game where for three consecutive years or more, they were working on this single property, just a very different scale and arc for these kind of scales of projects. After that, when I was still there full time as a technical game designer, worked a bit on boom blocks, doing lots of level design, some character, a bit of involvement with sort of production side uh, or rather sort of story framing of things. But that was also a very bizarre project that sort of fun and certainly beyond my involvement when it went on to become part of Smithsonian exhibit for games, which I'm very proud of. But again, a very small part of a much bigger team in those cases. Now, this was an enormous company, so literally a cubicle farm. It wouldn't be all that different from what you'd picture if you were looking at IBM or, or Meta or any of these other giant companies, Microsoft and so on. Just cubicles as far as you can see of an entire art department, legal department, business people on a whole separate floor, bunch of engineers and so on. And so that was not a bad fit for everybody. It was not what I liked about making games. I liked being on a small team. I liked getting to wear multiple hats. I appreciated getting to make sound effects and write code and work on level design. On small projects, you get to do that. On giant teams, people are often hyper-specialized if there's one thing that they might be some of the best people in the world at doing, but gosh, they got to stay in that lane or the whole machine falls apart. And so again, there's no blame there, but it is to say, if you like specialization, giant companies might be a great fit. If you di if you kind of like being a generalist of sorts, it's harder to find your place there because they want to fit you in a pigeonhole because that's how the structure works. So someone off to a smaller team. Uh, this is also where a whole bunch of the volunteering work has been giving talks. For schools, for arts festivals, for nonprofits, for jobs programs, anywhere I can, I like to share the joys of making games. This is also just a part of, you'll find many people in games are often giving talks. It's sort of a part of the career and part of the work, uh, including sometimes, like I say, lots of times as volunteering. I've given many conference and festival and classroom talks and so on. Most of those are not paid. A few every now and then are. On the bottom left is Indicate for a long time in arts festival. I'll go back to a few, a few slides from now, but Helped organize speakers for for many years as a volunteer. Uh, ex bottom right, extra credits. I did, uh, that was a paid work there doing some episodes for the popular YouTube channel several years back. Uh, but that's sort of the exception, not the rule. And if anything, that would help situate me to do that was all this volunteering, speaking work, getting experience, talking to crowds and groups about what I do. So around this time, though, I also went off to Zips App Play, a company that made a thing called playcrafter.com, a drag and drop website where people around the world can make just casual games online. Friends could play them and comment on them and share pieces of it. That was a really fun and neat experience. It started in someone's house in Silicon Valley with four of us just in one room. And again, I liked the small team effect. If I knew what David did, I knew what John did, and I knew what Mathilde did. That was something I personally found very rewarding. However, the nature of Silicon Valley startups is that they find outside funding. They become at a mercy of outside funding. And this is in no way blaming the CEOs, founders, other people involved with the company. But you sort of lose control over them sometimes, where the people who are in control of that funding have a lot of say over what gets done. I left the company around the time they pivoted to doing a different kind of thing than what I went there to do. It then got acquired by PopCap. EA then acquired PopCap. EA then dissolved the studio that had started this way. I was gone by that time, but it helped sort of teach me some of the, the, the dangers of when starting a business, relying on outside venture capital, relying on outside funding, being as you can, again, lose control over the thing you put years of your life into building and setting up. The same time as at the startup, I started doing experimental gameplay projects every single night. So for over 200 days in a row, I was mashing out playable prototypes online about different ways to visualize things, deal with interactivity, deal with different sort of vignettes of life and of thought and of communicating ideas about politics or veganism or whatever I had on my brain that day. Uh, of those, it was basically partly an experiment where I was keeping web metrics and tracking. And this is a pretty normal thing anymore, but out of all these experiments, I could just see, even from a simple basically counter, which anymore would be Google Analytics back then was probably statcounter.com, but I could tell which traffic was feeding into. And so I find four or five of those that were especially getting traffic spikes and not even enormous, just relative to the others. And that was my evidence to, okay, we'll double down on those. So this was early iPhone era. I ported four or five of those to iPhone and got some top ranked titles in entertainment and education. I uh, had a top games so the top games one that was actually funded by a publisher that was topple and that was a deal that came from a former coworker at electronic arts who had started that publisher and so this sort of became a, an era where I was doing a lot of mobile games I will say that the mobile game space has gotten a lot more bizarre and different than it was when I knew it uh, partly what actually happened to that counterintuitively in addition to people kind of know about the weird monetization and stuff that came about but essentially you used to be able to do anything on these devices you could do multi-touch and drag and pull from the edges and shake and all this stuff a lot of that's gotten overridden now as operating system level feedback for undo, for switch tasks, for pull down brightness screen, whatever. Before those features were there, 
We could just do those for mechanics and have a lot more options in our tool belt. At this point, I started shifting into teaching. I figured I really love helping people get started making games. I stretched out my budget by splitting costs in a mobile home in a suburb of San Francisco and started Chris Dalian's Game Dev Lessons. That's when I started making my textbooks, my material, my curriculum, started teaching private lessons and that kind of thing. I had read a book where Warren Robnett created Atari Adventure, which became sort of the foundational genre that led to things like Zelda, but in its own very particular historical vibe. He had written about the importance of interviewing industry legends while they're still with us, because it's kind of neat that the people are still here who really helped start this field. It's as if musicians had a chance to talk to Bach and Beethoven, like they were just around. And yeah, let's let's interview him. So I went out of my way to interview Warren Robnett. Turned out he was in the same area. He shared his story was that he had accomplished some great things in industry. He did this. He also did a bunch of educational games I liked growing up. But when he tried to teach in a traditional institution, he had a lot of barriers from having a hard time passing other people who had a PhD or other comparable credential as a terminal degree in uh, academia. And so he kind of indirectly encouraged me to explore graduate school as an option. When I went back to graduate school, one of the first things that happened, I got even more involved with Indicate. So in the past, I'd had a finalist there. I'd given my first talk in industry there. Uh, but I, Celia Pierce was one of the co-founders of it. And she kind of helped pull me over into helping me be an organizer helping curate talks and workshops and speakers and programming for those events. But that became another part of my volunteering, another part of my networking. And again, one of the things I like about the industry is particularly how much I get to meet people through it. This led to us helping to start Indicate Europe and gave me my first chance to travel to Paris. But that still happened because of games. While I was at Georgia Tech for my master's degree, which again, I sort of found my way back to because I thought I wanted to take a teaching path. I didn't want to hit the same ceilings that Warren Robin advised even he hit, which he was obviously had a far more important start to the industry than I did. So I went off to Georgia Tech for a master's degree in 2010. Same thing I did at Carnegie Mellon. I did over here. Started a giant student group. And I want to, I, I forgot to mention earlier, a key element of how I found that internship at EA was starting the group like this at Carnegie Mellon. Like that very much is what put me on the radar of the recruiter. We'd bring in guest speakers. While the recruiter is there from EA, I had my resume handy. Would not have happened if I had not been A, at that school, B, doing comp sci, and C, started this group and invited speakers to it. So it took initiative, but at the same time, it also took that credential. At Georgia Tech, same, similar kind of experience, five or eight games finishing per semester in big old teams. At this point, we shifted to Action Script 3 and Flash or Unity C Sharp. Variety of logistical changes in the environment. Native downloadable builds aren't uh, weren't as sensible to distribute anymore as it used to be. But these really became a core part of my educational pathway. So while the classroom learning was important and valuable and the credentials helped me open some doors... Really, it was the stuff I did on the side in addition to it that helped set me apart from other people who only had done the classwork in those kind of backgrounds. Around this time, these are what these games looked like. Uh, For the most part, again, it's kind of Flash. It was some entry, early level Unity stuff, a bit of mobile slash iPad development. One of those games was Vision by Proxy 2nd Edition. This was one of the more popular games that we worked on. It started as a student project before I was involved with it. It actually showcased at E3 Indicade when I was back when I was just a volunteer. So I was not yet involved as an organizer of the festival, but... The students had this neat idea that you, you're an alien who steals eyeballs to see the world from the lens of other people's perspectives as a gardener might, as a as a carpenter might, as a child might, and you use that to navigate the world. And I thought I, that was really just kind of capturing my imagination. I thought it was cool, but I also had ideas for how I thought I could do this better from the implementation design standpoint. So I helped them rebuild that engine from the ground up, basically a remake, reboot, whatever you call it. Kept none of the code, but kept the same concepts. In 10 months, we rebuilt it with a recruited team of better art, like not so better, Different artists for different kind of amount of workload they're willing to kind of sign on for. We got 7 million plays from that, about half of those overseas in China. That helped us build an even bigger team for a sequel to that, Miss Vision by Proxy. That resulted in getting business offers of companies wanting to pay us to put their logo in front, to get it to play on their website, those kind of things. But a bunch of these people from these groups went on to work at different companies throughout the industry. And this is one of the other nice things about starting these kind of organizations to help other people learn and get their start, was that I now have peers all over the place who at some point were in this college club together with me, that what got us all together was let's build projects together while we're in school. Uh, and it's just sort of a, a, a nice reason for doing that stuff. What I enjoy most of the work really is the people. It's the chance to interact with and meet and find so many folks at different conferences and events and meetups, a chance to work with people, a chance to introduce people to each other. Uh, it's been very much to me a highlight of making games. To this day, I've been running a podcast since 2015 which partially, among other reasons, I do as a reason to, to refresh those connections. Someone I worked with 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, I can reach out to them and be like, hey, Carl, haven't heard from you in a while. Want to be on the podcast? And it's kind of an interesting, fun way to re-engage in a conversation. Meanwhile, I can help sort of share some of the audience I've accumulated with them and share some of their perspectives with other people in my network. But it's just been another reason for doing this sort of thing, half on the side, half related to the work that I do. 
I've again figured out I love teaching, started volunteering all weekends to teach even more, started teaching optional workshops in the evenings outside of the classroom. Any chance I could teach, I just figured out that's what I love doing. And to this day, now I help people essentially build their first team projects with remote teams. Just some examples here of work that I'm minimally involved in these on the content creation or programming side, but I meet with people who are working on these projects and have questions about, hey, I'm trying to solve this problem. I'm stuck on something or I'm trying to figure out my schedule. Can you give me some ideas? And we've released 170 games this way the past seven or so years. It is a quirky way to have people learn and stuff. But it's, again, for many of these people, it's something where they are learning on their own time. It's outside of their primary career. It's something they're trying to supplement their skill set or something like that. But it's a way that increasingly through the affordances of education online, distributed systems and talks like this where someone doesn't have to even travel, new ways of learning are becoming options. This started as a, as a library group. We met every single week in the public library in the LA area. Uh, and now we're fully distributed on the, around the globe. So the gold pins are where we had projects pitched and led from. Blue pins are people who've contributed code, art, assets, level designs, etc. since we started this group. And it's just really been delightful to meet and interact with people from all over the globe, have their ideas, contribute their ideas, discuss and navigate their ideas together. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, it also involves working with people on production schedules or something somebody to lose track of as we focus on the content creation, the programming, the art, the level design, these sort of what people call hard skills in the sense of it, there's a tangible outcome to it. Uh, but there's this other side to it, which is the production long-term planning. And this is something where increasingly game jams is a format where people can kind of make a game in a few days or every weekend but you can't just take that and stretch it out and have it span months. And increasingly, the way that most people's actual projects come together is they have a few hours here and there throughout any given week. How do you make a thing still come together where you can put it down, come back to it, not lose your thread, and have your pieces still build up and release on time? And the producer mindsets become this other sort of side to it of realizing the life skill that comes from, if you can lead a long-term game project, how applicable that skill is to other areas of your life, where this is the same way I also kind of produce or plan out other content and things that I create. Involves lots of online collaboration, which we use GitHub for. Uh, there's obviously other sort of SBN or sort of similar networks out there for, or mechanisms for doing repositories. But even just again, exposing people to how this sort of thing works has for many of them opened up doors to options and careers, in addition to being a fun thing they can do, just like any other kind of weekend hobby. For additional careers connected to game development, uh, so obviously, A, there's working for other people's companies. And this is what I started my career doing. Some people make their entire career doing this. There's certainly nothing wrong with it. It's a valid line of work to do in life. There is a clear trade-off of I'm getting a salary, I do what's asked of me, and I go home. And, you know, if it was the wrong problem to solve, it was someone else's mistake. There's pros and cons to that. I, like I say, it was not necessarily a fit for me. The other challenge from this is that it's a high volatility industry. So even if you kind of sign up for that stability, still every two to five years, it's pretty common for even friends who are doing a great job, top of their field, know exactly what they're doing, didn't do anything wrong. The entire team gets shuffled because an intellectual property license didn't get renewed. They stop making games for a certain platform. They're relocating a studio. And so people are having to pick up their lives and move from LA to Seattle, from Seattle to Chicago, from Chicago to Orlando, from Orlando to, to London. And again, nothing wrong with that, but it is a consideration of this field as volatile as it is that even in the studio case, it's not as stable as some adjacent fields of other ways to do project management or programming or design work. I've also done making games independently with my own company. There's a major slice of entrepreneurship that can overlap in games. This is a whole much rockier path thing to do. Again, people make their entire career doing this. Nothing wrong doing it. I will say that quite often there's a side to it that's not discussed as often, which is essentially freelancing, contracting, porting. You're still often working on other people's stuff in some behind the scenes way, making advertising games or something just to help keep predictable income going. The games that a company's own intellectual property are, you know, this was our studio. This is our game idea to fund that. Either they're giving up control to the outside, like that company I talked about used venture capital and then had to pivot out of existence or else they are funding it by doing other kind of contract work. In so many cases, even as an ingredient of that, they're still working for other people. Teaching university, that was something where uh, when I was a PhD student at Georgia Tech, I had a lot of fun teaching programming type skills, design type skills in relation to sort of games, interactive environments, especially if you have an interest in kind of niche uses of this about their use in education, their use in communication, their use in cultural discussion. There's a lot of neat things happening in that space. Giving lessons independently, a lot of what I figured out is the people I like to help or the approach I like to help them with is much more low key. It's not quite put all the chips on the table. On the table. This is what I'm doing with my life. This is going to be my whole career path. This or bust. I like the sort of karate class level of intensity of this is a thing I do. It's a part of who I am. It's not all of who I am. And for that, I figured out that it's one of these areas where if you have a skill you have and you can transfer that skill to other people through teaching it, you can find work from simply I can teach you to do this any more than you can give someone lessons to be 
how to swing a golf club or how to play a piano, you absolutely can teach people skills you have. I've also done some paid writing for magazines, textbooks, and other people's popular YouTube channels. This is never my main thing, but it is nice out of the inventory of things you can do with this type of experience. If I need extra cash for something, unexpected costs have arisen in life or whatever, kind of like gig economy people can kind of dial on their phone for more hours of delivery or Uber or something. I can, if I need to, go hunting for, can I get some more articles written? Can I, does someone need a chapter of a book? Is there something else I can do that I can fit in a few hours here and there to get some additional income on short notice? Creating content, uh, this is where podcasting, YouTube, video courses, audiobooks, ebooks, I've got my YouTube award behind me. Uh, but essentially, a lot of things that I do for this, are they still kind of serve in the spider web of visibility, bringing people back to the primary line of work that I do, which is group teaching. But it's also been an opportunity to create content for a real direct audience and then have that be something people discover my work through. This has been a sort of interesting lens on I haven't needed to, as a small business, rely on outside paid marketing work. I mostly just do a lot of what's called content marketing, which is to say making information relevant to people who may or may not be my customer, but are more likely to be in which they can kind of find some value, start to form sort of a understanding of my approach to things, figure out if that's for them. And then lastly, building and supporting online training communities is my main work these days. And that is where, again, people are building practice projects just for fun, for freeware, for portfolio. I mean, they stuck, me and my trainers help them. That's sort of a small business I'm currently running. But anyway, uh, it's the end of the sort of slides deck. I'm happy to answer questions, clear up confusion, share stories about any specific part of that, including, again, the variety of different adjacent fields game making goes into. Sure thing, y'all. Have a great day. Keep making games. Bye.